Unlike viruses, bacteria, or genetic disorders, cancer has the capability of afflicting basically anyone. There's no hermetically sealed ball that will prevent you from developing cancer. There are certainly lifestyles and practices to reduce this likelihood, and some people possess genes that are adept at preventing such an outcome. But still, the right mutation in the wrong place just might lead to uncontrolled division. Mutation is a key aspect of evolution and an everyday part of living. Your cells are either constantly messing up or being interfered with by various molecules and external factors. Now the rate at which mutations occur is very low. You're talking one in hundreds of millions of instances. But there are trillions of cells, and eventually that one in hundreds of millions adds up. Cancer stems from an accumulation of mutations. Not every mutation will cause cancer, and often these mutations or errors will be caught and corrected. But in order to figure out what causes cancer, we need to learn why mutations occur. There are four main sources for mutations. We have incidental mutations that occur over any given cell's life, exposure to certain chemicals, exposure to ionizing radiation, and certain rare viruses. We're gonna focus on the unavoidable mechanisms. Let's first take a look at how our very own cells mutate themselves. Although genetic differences and mutations between you and your parents are the fundamental backbone for evolution, after you're born, the cells in your body continue to mutate. These mutations that are not passed along to children are called somatic mutations. In a study observing somatic mutations in lymphocytes over a human lifespan, Newborn cells had less than 500 mutations per cell, whereas those 100 years or older had over 3,000 per cell. The most common and inescapable source of mutation is the replication of DNA. Before each cell division, you must duplicate all of the information to pass along to each copy. DNA polymerase, the molecule responsible for assembling the new DNA copy, processes about 50 nucleotides per second in humans. At this rate, polymerase grabs the wrong base every 100,000 or so nucleotides, which is humanly impressive efficiency, but horribly efficient for our cells. Luckily, there are proofreading mechanisms that check for these kind of errors, and only about one in a couple thousand errors actually get passed along and become a real mutation. Therefore, the mutation rate is a little ambiguous, ranging from about one per 100 million to 10 billion nucleotides. If we assume one mutation every 500 million nucleotides, then this means roughly six mutations arise per cell division. As we continue to discuss mutation, keep in mind only a little over 8% of our DNA has useful information. Thus, a lot of mutations are harmless and have no impact on the inner workings of our cells. The other principal source of natural mutation occurs by physical readjustment of the DNA structure and gene loci in what are called translocations. Every now and then, DNA will experience a double-strand break. This is bad news bears, and our cells recognize it as such. Cells will employ proteins that come along and fuse the broken ends back together. But these proteins don't really know or care where they fuse them back together. If the broken strand is near the ends of another strand of DNA, they can be fused together. This is most prominent during prophase of mitosis, when the DNA starts condensing into chromosomes and moved around the cell. This physical manipulation can be a bit strenuous and cause certain sections of DNA to split apart. These split sections can then be fused to other chromosomes. This produces either reciprocal or non-reciprocal translocations. Let's look at two super fascinating examples. In many leukemias, there exists an infamous Philadelphia chromosome. This is a reciprocal translocation between the 9 and 22 chromosomes. If broken in the correct location, the ABL gene from the 9 chromosome can be placed near the BCR gene of the 22 chromosome. This new sequence can create a brand new fusion protein that then, due to its bastardized nature, floats around the cell stimulating the creation of cell cycle proteins. These initiate cell division and begin the rapid life cycle process found in cancers. In Burkitt lymphoma, 
The IGH gene promoter sequence from chromosome 14 is paired with the MYC protein sequence on chromosome 8. MYC proteins normally float around and encourage the production of proteins for cell division, but they are only around when the cell is about to divide. By being paired with this promoter sequence, MYC protein is constantly being produced, thus again triggering continual cell division. Clearly, our bodies are more than capable of producing their own mutations, but external factors can also increase this likelihood. The first external factor is, of course, chemicals. Chemistry is simply an interaction of charges, but these interactions can be highly complex. The molecules in our DNA, just like all molecules and chemicals, have charge imbalances. Some regions are more positive or negative than others. In my video on acids, we learned that electrons like to chill near oxygen and nitrogen. As a result, oxygen and nitrogen are always slightly more negative than their neighbor atoms. Well, A, T, C, and G are called nitrogen bases. Not only do they have nitrogen, but they are also bases, so they're fairly negative. If an electrophilic or positive molecule approaches nearby, it may want to fuse with the abundance of nitrogens and oxygens in our DNA. Two of the nitrogen bases are composed of two rings, which contain quite a few nitrogens. Plus, guanine also has this tasty oxygen just chilling out here. Therefore, guanine and adenine are the two most likely places an electrophilic molecule will bind to. This forms what is known as a DNA adduct. While bound to the DNA, this molecule prevents the cell from reading and creating proteins in this area. Thus, our cell needs to remove it. If the damage or adduct is minor, it can do so in a process called base excision repair. But if the adduct and damage is great, then it will be removed in a process called nucleotide excision repair. When adducts are detected, proteins are recruited to cut away the disrupted section. This cutout section is 12 or 13 nucleotides long. This gap is then filled via DNA polymerase, and just like with replication, this process can always make mistakes. DNA disruption from chemicals is very, very common. There are an uncomfortable number of DNA adducts just chilling on your DNA right now. A sample analysis of cancer-free prostate cells showed about 24,000 adducts per cell, and that was just a specific class of adduct they were looking for. The more exposure you have to specific chemicals with an affinity to binding to your DNA, the more chances of causing a mutation when it's fixed. The other primary chemical disruption to DNA is from oxidation. Some chemicals are carrying extra or unpaired electrons. This means they aren't particularly stable. There's a whole chapter of organic chemistry on resonance and electronegativity to explain why what I'm about to say happens. But basically, these two carbons on adenine and guanine are bound to two highly electronegative atoms with resonance structures. This means this carbon is very receptive to receive new electrons. Instead of binding to nitrogen or oxygen, now our little adduct binds to this carbon. Due to the nature of oxidative species, however, these are smaller and thus instead are removed by base excision repair. And as we learned, anytime new nucleotides are added, there's a minuscule chance it will be the wrong one. The last non-preventable source of mutation comes from radiation. When energetic photons come along, they can either excite or even completely dislodge electrons from DNA bases. The most common interaction occurs when ultraviolet light excites the double bond in a pyrimidine base. If another pyrimidine base is next to it, they can bind, forming a cyclobutane pyrimidine dimer, or a 6-4 photoproduct if the orientation is different. This disrupts the shape of the DNA and requires fixing via the nucleotide excision repair mechanism, again introducing potential for errors. What does this mean for us? Are we simply at the mercy of time to accumulate mutations until we inevitably fall apart from the inside? Well, kinda, but our body has methods of preventing this. Evolution has learned that having proteins around that self-immolate a cell is a better solution than trying to fix a bunch of problems with the DNA. If there are a lot of problems with the DNA, some of the proteins responsible for fixing it will wake up anti-tumor proteins. 
These proteins check if the DNA problems can be solved or if they should just start destroying the cell. ATM kinase is involved in repairing extensive DNA damage and also phosphorylates the P53 protein. If there are many DNA problems, then there are more ATM kinases to fix them, which stimulate more P53 protein. P53 is THE key protein to solve and prevent cancers. Hence its name, Tumor Protein 53. If there are a lot of phosphorylated P53 floating around, the cell will shut down in a process called apoptosis, preventing potential cancers. It should come as no surprise then that mutations to TP53 are found in essentially all cancers. Let me be clear, not all cancers are caused by a mutation of TP53, but a mutation of TP53 is almost certainly going to cause cancer. This gene is not the only defense our cells have against cancer, there are others. But strangely, it seems it's much more susceptible to mutation. We have two copies of every gene. For most of the tumor suppressing genes, a mutation in one will not disrupt the other. But, in what appears to still not be a fully understood mechanism, a mutation in a single TP53 gene silences or disrupts the functioning of the other. This makes TP53 the key gene to know when it comes to discussing cancer and a cell's defense against them. Swapping one of the 393 amino acids in the P53 protein for another can disrupt the protein's function, preventing it from doing its job. That's cancer. A gradual, continual buildup of mutations in our cells until one of them just so happens to be in the right place to either overwhelm or bypass our cells' natural mechanisms to prevent them. There are certainly things you can do to speed up or slow down the accumulation of mutations, but the sheer number of routes or possible mechanisms to trigger cancers and the randomness of the mutation process makes curing cancer an incredibly difficult endeavor. As the medical and pharmacological fields continue to advance their understanding in technologies for manipulating proteins, eventually we should be able to teach our immune systems how to effectively fight off most, if not all, cancers. And that's probably a topic for a future video, because like many things in science, the mechanisms of doing so are super interesting. But until we've nailed down the cure for cancer, maybe pop on some sunscreen and cut down on those guilty pleasures.